reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to stop. This morning, let's take our Bibles and turn in the New Testament to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 13, the King's Parables. Matthew chapter 13. Jesus is the future King of Israel. He's the King of all of our hearts today, if we open them to Him. And we're going to see seven parables. And parables are short stories. They're little allegories. We often can get ideas by telling stories. Um, sometimes it makes it more real. And uh, we're going to see today that the Lord is giving parables, uh, not so much to illustrate a truth as to both illustrate and hide a truth. By now his ministry is such that he is gaining a lot of opposition, a lot of controversy. And we find uh, tension. Somebody mentioned before service about this last week or these weeks being difficult, a lot of animosity and what have you. The animosity which Jesus was receiving, the tension he was receiving was unbelievable. They wanted to kill him. They actually wanted to kill him. And so uh, we find that what he's doing now is he is going to start to teach, not openly as he did before, but in parables. A parable will do two things. For the one who is hungry, it'll reveal. It'll open up that truth in a very special way. For the one who is the enemy, it'll conceal it and hide it. Don't cast your pearls before swine. So we're going to find seven parables, and they all deal with the same question. What is going to happen to the kingdom of God? Jesus is talking about the kingdom. He's not involved with current politics, with the Pharisees, with Rome, which is ruling at that time. He doesn't get sidetracked by political issues as the church does today. He stays focused on the kingdom. Years ago, the Lord told me, don't get into politics. My uncle, my mother's brother, went to church one time with his wife to the congregational church. He came off that experience and said, Jerry, that pastor was talking about politics. That pastor has no more right to dictate political views than anybody else. He should stick with the Bible. I said, Carl, you're right. Absolutely. And the Lord said to me, stay off the political scene. Talk about the kingdom. And that's what we're supposed to be doing is talking about the kingdom of God. Well, the kingdom of God we're going to see here in this, uh, uh, this chapter is talking about that period uh, from the Lord's rejection when he's crucified until his second coming. In other words, the current church age. And we're going to see what the church is like. And it's not what we think it is. We talk about the Christian church. The Christian church, by definition of numbers, is 2.1 billion people out of 7 billion. That's a lot of people. 2.1 billion. Most of them are Catholic, the majority. Uh, a good 65% of those are Catholic, 35% Protestants, some of the others just uh, non-identified. Uh, non That's a big number. That's a huge number. 2.1 billion people profess to be Christians out of 7 billion people. That is the kingdom of heaven right now here on earth. It is not the kingdom of God. There's a difference. Matthew talks about the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven is all those who profess to be believers. Believers and make-believers. The kingdom of God, talked about by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is the true, born-again, spirit-filled, focused-on-Jesus church. So we're talking here about the so-called church, if you will. We're going to see this illustration. Uh, it begins small, Jesus and the disciples. It grows to be huge. It's unstoppable. It's a great kingdom and it's very confusing with believers and make-believers. But within it, 
God still maintains his people, true Israel and his true church. And in the end, God's going to separate the wicked from the righteous. So in the church today, in the pulpits today, there are true believers and there are make-believers. It's not up to us to decide. It's up to the Lord in time to separate the wheat from the chaff. Amen? So we're going to talk about these parables and we're going to see the principles that really apply to our lives. And as always, let's turn this word up and look at it as a mirror. I got in the mirror this morning, got over the shock of how I look and uh, began to make some adjustments. My wife came in, turned on the light and I said, please turn the light off. I'm not ready to see myself in the full light yet. But we need to turn the light on in God's word. This is a mirror. Lord, help me to see myself and make the necessary adjustments. So we find, uh, Lord, right now, help us to open our hearts and to receive your word. Help us to really see what you have for us and be changed by it. In Jesus' name, amen. These are very famous parables. We know this one so well, the parable of the sower. And this is very dear to my heart because I went down to Manan's True Value on Friday and bought some grass seed and said to the owner, Frank, how much time do I have to sow seed? He said, Jerry, you have two weeks. It needs 21 days to germinate, do it within two weeks. So after you folks leave and I smile and say have a great day, I get on the blue jeans and I'm going to be sowing seed for the next couple of days to get ready for the harvest next spring. All right, let's talk about sowing seed. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. And great multitudes were gathered together to him so that he got into a boat and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. That was typical in those days. The teacher sat and the students often stood. In any event, uh, they're going to be hearing him. He's so crowded. They're still excited about the word. Opposition is there from the Pharisees, but still there are people listening to his words. And he's now going to speak to them in parables. Verse 3, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside. And the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places, where they did not have much earth. And they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So he's now talking in a story, in an allegory. The unbelievers are going to say, what? But the believers who are hungry are going to say, what does this mean? And so here's this picture of the sower in those days, and not so much today. Now you'd sow your lawn either by hand a little bit here and there, or you'd walk behind a Scots spreader. And you'd have your setting just at a certain level. But in those days, they'd have a big bag of seed. And they would just put their hand in and throw it to the right and throw it to the left. And indiscriminately get that seed out. The seed here we're going to see is the word of God. And uh, different kinds of soil are going to bring forth different results. So we find here that in verse 4, some seed fell on the wayside. That means the pathway. In the harvest area, there are certain pathways. And some of that seed falls on the pathway. It's the ground is hard. It doesn't get into the ground. And the birds come and devour it, pick it up. I said to uh, Frank about sowing the seed. He said, don't put too much down because you're going to be feeding the birds. You're not going to be helping to get the seed into the ground. So when you share the word, some people have a hard heart like that pathway. And the birds we're going to see represent the evil one, Satan. In parables, birds always speak of Satan and his demonic forces. They will steal that word. You and I have shared the word with people, and they say what? Once my sister said to me, she's brilliant, has a higher IQ by far than I do, uh, lives on the West Coast, and she said, I was watching one of your, your, your videos the other day. She's six months younger than I. We grew up together. We've known each other all of our lives. I listened to, that's a stepsister, by the way, six months uh, difference. She said, I listened to your video. And Jell, she calls me Jell for jelly. Jell, I have no idea what you're talking about. She doesn't know the Lord. 
And so it fell on hard ground. So some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth. And they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. So some of that seed's going to go into the ground, and it's going to disappear in the ground, and it's going to look like seed's going to come forth in fruit. And so underneath the ground, you can't see it on the surface, underneath the ground is stones. So it goes down just so far, hits the stones, and dies. Then the sun, the sun comes up, verse 6, they're scorched, they don't have any root, they wither away, they can't get that root down deep enough. Now the third kind of soil is also bad because it looks good on the surface and it has thorns and the thorns spring up and choke the seed. So that doesn't bring forth any fruit. So out of so far, three quarters is not bringing forth any results. But the fourth seed, the fourth type, falls on good ground and it yields a crop some a hundred times, some 60, some 30. Some little Sunday school teacher, I think it was Henrietta Mears, out in California, had, she was a great writer and a great woman of God. She had a Sunday school class. And a little fellow grew up in that little Sunday school class and she sowed seeds into his heart. And it fell on good ground. And that little guy grew up to be Billy Graham. And that seed brought forth hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times the sowing of the seed. So don't be discouraged when you share the word and it falls on the pathway. Uh, it falls on stony ground. It falls on uh, thorny ground. Pray for that good soil. Pray that those who hear that word will be good soil. That's for the unbeliever. What about for the believer? Here I am, Jerry. I love Jesus. I have good soil. And Jesus says, Jerry, there's an area in your life and I want you to give it up. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Uh. How's my soil? How's my soil? I don't believe that's for today. I don't believe that kind of holiness is for today. Hard pathway soil. Yes, Lord, help me, heal me. I love you, Lord. I'm living clean one week, two weeks, three weeks. Back into the old soup pot, stony ground. And uh, I'd love to serve the Lord, but I haven't got time. I've got work to do. I just can't spend time in prayer. Can't spend time in the word. Thorny ground, you get the idea. So that even in our hearts as well, we've got different kinds of soil. So it's foolish to say, I'm a believer, it's all good soil. No, there's some good soil. You certainly have good soil for salvation. You're heaven bound. But as far as living for the Lord and being tolerant, you know, I, I love Jesus, but I can't stand members of the opposite political party. That's not good soil. We need to be able to say, Lord, forgive me and heal me. All right, the purpose of the parables now, verse 10. The disciples came and said to him, and he talked uh, alone with them. They wanted to be private with him. Why do you speak to them in parables? We haven't heard these stories before. Why are you doing that? He answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. So you know the kingdom, you love me, and because you're hungry, I'll give you more. But for those who don't, even what they have will be taken away, it's going to come to nothing. Therefore, that means that that's that stony ground, that thorny ground. The word got in there and then it just died. Therefore, I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. So I'm concealing it from them because they don't want to hear God's word. It's not that he is holding them back from receiving the word. They don't want the word. And so therefore, it's just not going to be clear to them. It's going to be kind of uh, befuddled. And in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. God spoke this ahead of time. Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. They don't want to hear. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. I want to heal them. A friend of mine had a huge church. She became the, probably the third largest church in the United States. 
We're talking mega, mega, mega church. Dear friend, very close to me, and in the early part of his life, he had small churches, never more than 100 people. And he was preaching a gospel that salvation includes physical healing, speaking in tongues, the power of the Spirit, full gospel, full Pentecostal experience. Never had more than 100 people. He got tired. He left the ministry, went back to carpentry. And then suddenly a new wave came and he got involved with that new movement and it was called the Jesus Movement and he began to get involved and I don't know what his thinking was but suddenly things began to change and the, the healing began to drop away and the, the tongues began to drop away and, and God is love was the main message, which he is. Uh, and it got to be a very, very sanitized message without any real power and anointing. And it grew and it grew, it grew from one service to two services to three services to a different location. And it got to the point where they were having 15,000 people coming on a Sunday morning. And one day we had to talk about divine healing. And I said, healing is in the atonement. Jesus died for our sicknesses. And he said, no, he didn't. And uh, it wasn't that long after I prayed for him. And not long after that, I saw him in the pulpit with a cannula and he was breathing his last, and then he was just, he died of lung cancer, never smoked a day in his life. And uh, just sad, sad. Family fought over the ministry. Uh, son sued daughter, and they sued the elders, and it was just, just a mess. And so um, it's, you need to stick with the, the mysteries. I don't care if there's nobody here. My wife said yesterday, even if there's only five people, maybe that's prophetic, I don't know. If there's only five people, still preach the word of God. I hope you're one of the five who will still be here. If not, we have four dogs who can come in and substitute there. So uh, preach the truth. Uh, but they, they, they don't want to hear. They don't want to hear that. And so, uh, Lord, I want to have a heart that wants to hear. It's easy to point fingers out there and say, they're not receiving all the truth that I have. But maybe I'm not receiving all the truth that God wants me to have. Maybe I've got a little block in some area that needs to be changed. And if you have the Holy Spirit in you, he's very happy to show you areas where your soil is not good, where it's not good. And so what do you have to do? When I go outside today and I start to work on that lawn and I start to uh, pull the dead grass away and I begin to put the seed down and uh, I've, got a fertilizer, I've got a seed that's got some good fertilizer in it, but sometimes you need that fertilizer, don't you? Well, what's the fertilizer? It's God's word. It's the seed and it's the fertilizer. It's all that you need all in one because God wants you to be here and he wants you what? To be healed. Lord, I want to be healed. Verse six, for, um, verse 16, blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. Thank God I can see and hear God's word. I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. David, Samuel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, they would have left, given their left arm to be able to see Jesus. And with all that these disciples had to see when Jesus died, he said, don't you go any place because you don't have all that you need now. He said, you wait. Ten days later, the Holy Spirit came upon them and the most blessed generation of all began. So you and I have the Holy Spirit in us and we are the most blessed of all. The disciples would have loved to see this powerful movement. Many of them did. A couple of them died early, but the powerful movement of God through the Holy Spirit. Well, now he explains the parable, which we've already pretty much covered. Verse 18. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, when the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart, this is he who received seed by the wayside. So my dear sister, when she said, I have no idea what you're talking about, unfortunately had heart of wayside. Still pray for her. Her name is Susan, very dear. Well, God's still trying to reach her through her son who married a born-again Christian whose mother-in-law makes me seem backslidden by comparison. She's a lawyer and a Bible teacher, and she is a fanatic for the Lord. And she drags my sister to Christmas Eve service at the church they go to in Phoenix every year. So my sister is still being exposed to it. One door is closed, and God opens another. Verse 20, he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word 
and immediately receives it with joy. Hallelujah, walks the aisle, thank you Jesus. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. So it looks good in the beginning, born again, anointed with oil, maybe speaks in tongues, I don't know. Uh, and suddenly uh, tribulation comes, persecution. I don't want to have to be a Christian. No, I'm not really a Christian. And that person goes underground and, is, and really never knew the Lord at all. It looked like salvation. It looks like they lost their salvation. They never had it. It never really bore fruit. Verse 22, he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. So this one also looks like he is saved, but he's not because of the cares of this world. I'm just too busy, got too many problems, can't go to church, can't get involved with God's word, can't pray, and I got to make more money. I got to do a second job and a third and a fourth and no fruit. They're unfruitful. They didn't lose their salvation. they would never had it. Here's the one who did. Verse 23, he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundred fold, some 60, some 30. Isaiah in the book of Genesis knew the Lord, was a tither, no doubt, the way his father was and his son-to-be, Jacob. He was able to produce, largely through flocks, maybe through, through produce, a hundredfold. God increased him a hundredfold. You're short on money. Your God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and he owns the hills and all the minerals under the hills. There's nothing he cannot do. You bring that 10% to him, that tithe of your, of your income, and he will open the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing you cannot contain. And I've been praying recently for my wife and me and our family to be able to be super abundantly blessed, not only have our needs met, but to reach out and meet the needs of others as never before. Our God is able, amen? That's the first parable, parable of the soil. Lord, may my heart be good soil. Now, verse uh, 24, let's look at the parable of the wheat and the tares, or the wheat and the weeds. We don't use the word tares much. Weeds. You know what weeds are? If you don't know what weeds are, stick around after church, and I will show you weeds, the most beautiful, multifaceted, colored weeds you can ever possibly imagine. And I will show you a big container of weed killer as well. All right, and I'll give you a, a nice mask and send you around the lawn, and you'll be busy for a while. Verse 24, another parable he put forth to them, saying, this is about the wheat and the weeds. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. It was good seed. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. So here we find the good seed, and it's good soil, but here is the enemy who's coming and he's sowing weeds in among the wheat, and then he leaves. Now when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares or the weeds also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and the time of harvest, uh, I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So in the kingdom, among the 2.1 billion people, there is wheat, and there are weeds. And it's not my job to go out and try to say, you, 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 and you are tares, and you, you, and you are wheat. That's not our job. Our job is to simply sow the seed. And some will have wheat, and some will have weeds. That's up to the Lord to take care of. Um, as far as the good soil, we talked about three out of four seeds went bad. It doesn't mean literally that 25% of the people are going to be saved. But it does speak to the fact that the majority of those who profess to be believers really are not. 
the, uh, if you're interested in statistics and really want to dig into this subject, uh, go online and Google Barna, B-A-R-N-A, -A, Barna Reports. Barna Reports, they're the Gallup uh, reports, really, of uh, Christian statistics, and they will give you all sorts of studies, uh, studies like we've I've already talked about, where out of the 100 major metropolitan areas in the country, Albany, Schenectady, and Troy is dead last in the country as far as Bible literacy, as far as faith is concerned. Uh, other statistics that talk about the fact that worldwide, we don't know the exact percentage of believers, but they have about 10 questions they put forth to people. Do you believe that salvation is by Jesus Christ alone? Do you go to church? Do you study God's word, etc.? Out of those 10 questions or so, probably fewer than 10% of the people would be able to say, yes, I really am able to qualify under those questions that are really born again. So uh, a lot of make-believe and a very little small number who are truly saved. And Jesus forecast that as well. He said, fear not, little flock. It is your Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. Straight is the way and narrow is the gate, and few there be that find it. So being big is not a great indication of anything. Years ago, we were about three or four years into the ministry, and we were down in downtown Albany. Uh, we had about 60 people there. And my brother, who lived in Daytona Beach, was having lunch one day with the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Daytona Beach. He was a past president of the Southern Baptist Convention. He had a huge mega church in Daytona Beach. My brother was having lunch with him, and he said, you know, my, my brother Jerry has a church. It's a small little church in Albany. And he says there are about 60 people. And he said they're, they're all born again. They all speak with tongues. They love the Lord. And the other pastor hung his head with this huge multiple thousands of church. And he hung his head and he said, I think I may have 60 people who know and love the Lord as well. So numbers don't mean anything. The Lord showed me this. Large numbers mean one thing. Large numbers, period. So we're looking for quality, not for quantity. Well, he's talking about the fact here that uh, we're going to see some are believers, some are not. It's not up to us to believe uh, that we know who is who and judge accordingly. We simply pray for everybody, right? Uh, the next parable, verse 31, is the parable of the mustard seed. Um, and in the mustard seed parable, we're going to see this Christianity, uh, both believers and unbelievers, is going to grow very rapidly. Uh, the mustard seed was the smallest seed that they had, tiny, tiny little seed. Another parable he put forth to them, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. This is not the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God is all believers. Kingdom of heaven is everybody who claims to be a believer. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and he sowed in his soil. It's a tiny little seed. Indeed, it's the least of all the seeds. But when it's grown, it's greater than the herbs and becomes a tree. It goes past the stage of a tree, of an herb, past the stage of a bush. It now becomes an actual tree. They can grow 15 feet high so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Birds in parables are evil. This is a huge church filled with birds, with the evil one. And so you have to be very, very careful uh, in talking about this church, that church, what have you. Keep your eyes on the Lord. When you listen to the radio and you hear all this teaching going on, you need the Lord to tell you what's true and what's not true. Better yet, listen to Pastor Kelly and me. We'll, we'll give you the truth. Amen? <laughs> all right, so that's the mustard seed. So the, uh, the, the so-called church is going to grow very rapidly, and so it has from 12 disciples and 120 on the day of Pentecost to 2.1 billion and growing, growing quickly. And what, that, what does that mean, Christianity? I don't even know what Christianity means. I guess it really means, at best, when you're filling out a form, you're not a Muslim, you're not a Hindu, you're, not a, you're just a Christian. Okay? Well, let's watch out for what makes the believer different from the unbeliever. And that is the, the leaven. Now, believers do sin, but they don't live in that sin. Verse 33, the parable of the yeast. 
Here, make believers are going to grow in numbers unhindered. Another parable he spoke to them, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, that's yeast, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal until it was all leavened. So yeast is good if you like your bread, which uh, is not flat bread or matzah. Uh, that's good, but yeast, because it is a little bit amount, of, it gets it gets into that substance and permeates it and fills it and causes it to change its shape and form. It speaks of sin. It, yeast speaks of sin, and that's why on the day of uh, some of the different services, the Lord says, "Get the leaven out of the kitchen." For Passover, the Jewish woman has to get all yeast out of her kitchen because it represents sin. And that's the way sin is. Sin gets into your life and it begins to spread and it spreads to other people around you. It gets into the church and this church, 2.1 billion, has a lot of leaven in it. We were talking before, one of the brothers said something about Thanksgiving. My brother Casey used to say it's the only truly Christian holiday. Everything else comes from the pagans. Christmas and Easter, those are all pagan holidays which the church brought in to try to appease those who call themselves Christians. The only truly Christian holiday is Thanksgiving. I'm not so sure even how much of Christ is celebrated at Thanksgiving, even on that holiday. In any event, the parable of the mustard seed and yeast. Now the parable of the weeds, he goes back and explains that, verse 36. Then it says, uh, let's, verse 34, for, uh, all these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables, and without a parable he did not speak to them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. Talking about that from Psalm 78. Now he goes back and explains the parable of the tares or the weeds. Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And so he answered and said, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. That's Jesus. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. So here the seed is the believer. The tare is the unbeliever. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it'll be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. And those who practice lawlessness, will be, they'll be cast them into the furnace of fire. They'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. And he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So at the end of the age, the end of time, the, we, the unbelievers will be brought before the white throne judgment. They'll be convicted of not receiving Christ and then cast into the lake of fire forever and ever because they were not truly believers in the Lord. Now he gives us in verse 44 another parable. This is the parable of the hidden treasure. The meaning here is that Jesus came to redeem Israel, his treasure. And for us, we are his treasure as well if we know Christ. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys that field. So if you were to buy a piece of property and somebody told you that uh, the property's not that worth that much, but there's, a, there's hidden gold there, you'd buy that uh, property just to get that gold, wouldn't you? Amen. Well, Jesus bought this world got it back from Satan. God gave the world to Adam and Eve. They gave it to Satan by submission. Jesus bought this world back. He didn't care about the world. He cared about you and me. We are the hidden treasure in this world. And so we need to realize that we are the hidden treasure. Israel, true Israel, will be the hidden treasure as well when the Lord purifies her and brings her into his kingdom. Then there's the pearl of the great price. Look at verse 45. This meaning, I think, is that Jesus gave his life to redeem the church. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. 
He gave everything. And so Jesus gave his life. The parable of the hidden treasure where he buys the treasure, that's with the cost of his own blood. Here he gives his life for you and for me because he wants for us to be the pearl of great price. He loves you. You're very important to him. He gave his life for you. Then we have the parable of the dragnet. The parable of the net. Here we find that angels will separate the wicked from the righteous at the end of the age. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. And so it'll be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to them, Have you understood all these things? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he said to them, Therefore every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. So here in the dragnet, they understood about that because they were fishermen for the most part. They would not take a pole and a little bit of a minnow at the end of it. They would throw out a big net and drag it in. And that's what the kingdom of heaven is like today. 2.1 billion people, big net. And it's bringing up true fish and bringing up uh, beer cans and, and uh, soda pop cans and what have you. And so it's up now to the angels. They're going to separate those who are believers from those who are unbelievers. And those who are not believers are going to be cast into the furnace of fire. There again is the lake of fire or hell. There's going to be wailing and there's going to be gnashing of teeth. And it's going to go on for eternity. So verse 52, that scribe is somebody who's instructed in the kingdom of heaven. He's like a householder, brings out of his treasure things new and old. And so you and I need to do that. My wife and I get on the radio and on television and we share truths, uh, some new and some old. If you listen to our programs and we get into application of it, Kelly might say, uh, something happened to me 30 years ago and how the Lord delivered me. That, that's old. Uh, something happened this week and God did this for me. That's new. And so uh, you and I have old treasures and we have new treasures, proofs of God's love and care. We bring them out and share them with others. So these are the parables. The parable of the soil is uh, the meaning there. You can see in your outline, the gospel will be rejected by most people. Most will not receive the good news. The parable of the wheat and the weeds, believers and unbelievers are going to exist together in the so-called church. The parable of the yeast, make believers are going to grow in numbers unhindered, tremendous. The parable of the weeds uh, is then explained. The hidden treasure parable, he'll, he'll redeem Israel, his treasure, he'll redeem you and me, his treasure. That pearl of great price, Jesus gave his life to redeem you and to redeem me. And then for that net, the angels are going to separate the wicked from the righteous. He'll sort that all out. Now we're going to begin to see that the opposition is growing and in his own hometown, they don't believe that he really is the Messiah. Now it came to pass, verse 53, when Jesus had finished these parables that he departed from there and when he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue. So they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? So they listened to his words and they watched his works, his healing miracles. Did they accept him? Verse 55. Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joses, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? This is a hometown boy. This is Jesus who lived down the street. Joseph's boy. And they were offended. They were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and in his own house. Now, now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So anybody who has served the Lord knows that. Well, that's Jerry. Oh, I remember him in the law office days. I remember him dating this one and that one and what have you. This is Kelly. She did this and she did that. And uh, the kid growing up around the, the corner. 
And yet uh, there were those who saw something in you. I'm going to tell the story about the pig farmer. I got to do that. Around the corner is the Constantine Farms. There was a pig farmer. Mr. Constantine owned that. And this little girl, Kelly Gatto, was there at age, what, 14, with her friends, and uh, about five or six friends. And Mr. Gatto, the pig farmer, looked at Kelly, and he said to her, one day you're going to become a teacher. He saw the way she was reacting with all the kids, and all the girls and boys were lining up as Kelly counted heads and ordered them here and ordered them there. And he saw something in her as a teacher. Today, many years later, Perhaps the pig farmer's in, in heaven with the Lord, but she's teaching God's word. She's teaching over at Maria College. And so there are those, even when you're young, who can see something in you. And so uh, God is the one who sees what he wants to bring forth in us. Uh, but others know Kelly and growing up, and oh, that's just Kelly. They know Jerry, and oh, that's just Jerry. Nothing good coming from that. Well, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country. Your own family might not think much of you. That's all right. You've got a bigger family of God out there. You take care of them. Amen? So let's examine our hearts. We can call ourselves Christians, but that doesn't make us a Christian. It has to be a personal faith relationship in Jesus Christ. One question I think separates the believer from the unbeliever. If you were to die today and you were to go to heaven and the Lord were to say to you at the pearly gate, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? There's only one answer that's acceptable. Lord, I'm here not because of what I did or didn't do, but because of what you did for me. You died for my sins. You are my only passage into heaven. I believe that you died for my sins. You are my Lord. You're my Savior. I trust in you and you alone. Everything that I have is really riding on you, Lord. You're my God. I trust in you. If that's our prayer, and we really mean it, we are believers. We still have to work on some issues in our hearts, the different soils, but we're saved. If not, give your heart to the Lord. We're going to give a chance for those on television and, and for YouTube right now to do the same thing. Let's all bow our hearts before the Lord. Father, we're grateful for this chance to have studied your word. And it's exciting to know that the church is growing, but it's also concerning to know that it's not all, all the true church. The Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians, examine your hearts to see if you are in the faith. We can profess it, but is it true? Lord Jesus, examine our hearts. Convict us of our sins and help us now, Lord, to receive you. We ask you to come into our hearts Forgive us for our sins. Live your life in us. We will live for you and we will serve you. And we ask, Lord Jesus, that you will bring us into your kingdom when our work on earth is done. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Reach out.